Welcome everyone to the next episode of the DVL lecture series. Um, today we're happy to have Michael Bronstein here to talk about geometric deep learning. Michael Bronstein is a professor at the Imperial College London, where he holds a chair in machine learning and pattern recognition. And he's also the head of the graph learning research at Twitter. He also heads uh, ML research in project CETI, a heterozygous prize winning collaboration aimed at understanding the communication of sperm whales. He received a PhD from the Technion in 2007, and he has held visiting appointments at Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and Tel Aviv University, and has also been affiliated with three institutes for advanced studies. At TU Munich here as a Rudolf Diesel Fellow, at Harvard as a Radcliffe Fellow, and at Princeton as a visitor. He is the recipient of five ERC grants, two Google Faculty Research Awards, and two Amazon AWS ML Research Awards. He's a member of the Academia Europe, fellow of the IEEE, IAPR, and ELIS, ACM Distinguished Speaker, and World Economic Forum Young Scientist. In addition to his academic career, Michael is a serial entrepreneur and founder of multiple startup companies, including Novafora, InVision, acquired by Intel in 2012, Video Sites, and Fabula AI, which was acquired by Twitter in 2019. He has previously served as principal engineer at Intel Perceptual Computing and was one of the key developers of the Intel RealSense technology. Today, he's going to talk about geometric deep learning, a topic he has been working on for quite a while now, about past, present, and uh, future. So we're really looking forward to your talk. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, and everyone for the invitation. Really great to be at Stum, even though virtually. So uh, allow me to, to start from uh, maybe uh, going back 2000 years ago and uh, well, uh, Euclid uh, is uh, uh, very famous, or may maybe even uh, semi-mythological uh, uh, ancient Greek scientist. And for uh, around 2000 years, uh, when we used the word uh, geometry, it exclusively referred to, uh, to the geometry, uh, what we nowadays call Euclidean geometry. But uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, this monopoly uh, of Euclidean geometry broke with the introduction of non-Euclidean uh, geometric constructions by Lobachevsky, Boyei, Gauss himself, even though he never published it, and uh, his PhD student, Bernard Riemann. And very quickly, geometry diverged into this zoo of different geometries that, that were completely disconnected fields. And uh, scientists, mathematicians of, of that time even questioned what actually defines uh, geometry and uh, ridiculous questions of the kind, my geometry is better than your geometry, were a com a pretty commonplace. So uh, a way to systematize, systematize this uh, zoo came from uh, Felix Klein, who was also a quite remarkable uh, uh, prodigy, I would say, uh, uh, appointed, I think, at the age of 20-something as a full professor at a small university also in, in Bavaria at Erlangen. And he was asked to, to uh, deliver an inaugural talk where he outlines his research program, which happened in uh, uh, 1872. So actually there is a lot of uh, misinformation about uh, this inaugural talk. So people think that, that he actually delivered uh, what nowadays is called the Erlangen program in this talk, but uh, the talk didn't happen on the date uh, that is mentioned, let's say in Wikipedia. And he didn't talk about mathematics at all. He talked about education to, uh, to a general uh, uh, public. So what is, is uh, called the Erlangen program, uh, which was his uh, research uh, idea about approaching uh, geometry, was published as this uh, small brochure. And basically the idea of uh, Klein was uh, really fundamental in, uh, in perspective that uh, he suggested to approach the geometry as the study of invariance. So quantities that are not affected or preserved under certain types of transformations, what we also call symmetries. And if you think Euclidean geometry, the standard geometry that, that existed before, uh, a lot of uh, such structures are preserved under Euclidean transformations, which are rigid motions. So these are, for example, areas, distances, angles, and so on. So a more general type of geometry considers affine transformations, which, for example, pre preserve parallelism, but they don't preserve areas, let's say. So uh, really, affine geometry is the study of parallel, uh, parallel lines. And then projective geometry is the most uh, general construction of uh, such geometries where 
the uh, transformations are the, the general uh, linear group. And the way of formalizing these, uh, uh, these um, uh, transformations was using the formalism of group theory. And then you can say that uh, certain geometries are more general than, one, uh, than others because uh, the more specific geometries are uh, defined by uh, groups of transformations that are subgroups of the more general group. And this really put an end to this question, which geometry is more general, which geometry is better. And it had a really fundamental impact on all fields of science and particularly uh, uh, affected was uh, mathematical physics, where uh, came uh, uh, astounding results such as the, the Noether theorem, which allowed to derive uh, conservation laws from first principles. So if before that, uh, to derive a property such conservation of energy, you had to conduct thousand experiments and then measure the energy and say that uh, it is not changed. So therefore we believe that energy is, is conserved, but it comes out of the blue. So uh, Noether's theorem, which used exactly these ideas of Klein, uh, allowed to prove mathematically that certain symmetry, in this case, the symmetry of time, uh, allows to derive mathematically from certain type of uh, variational problem, the, uh, uh, the conservation of energy. And uh, basically this is very well grounded. This is first principle because assuming symmetry of time means uh, that your experiment would not change if you conduct it today or tomorrow. And actually all modern physics, all conservation laws can be derived from, uh, from respective symmetries. So that's why when in theoretical physics you hear about uh, uh, looking for certain types of symmetry, that's exactly this. So what does it have to do with, uh, with deep learning? Uh, what we call geometric deep learning, we at least maybe somewhat naively or, or uh, uh, in a simplified way, we try to apply the same ideas of Klein to uh, uh, geometrize, so to say, uh, problems in uh, in machine learning and in deep learning in particular. And I will try to show today how very well familiar architectures can actually be derived from these first principles of symmetry and, and invariance. Okay, so maybe it's a little bit uh, arrogant titles, right, uh, right, talking about the past, the present and the future, but uh, I will try to give you an idea of, uh, of uh, what it is, where it comes from, uh, show what uh, uh, basically what are the, the, the main uh, uh, problems that exist nowadays and probably most excitingly the open questions and the, the interesting applications. I hope that I also have enough time for all this. So let me start from uh, again quite far away. Uh, so let's look at the very first neural networks that were developed, uh, uh, the, the perceptron that dates uh, date back to the work of uh, Frank Rosenblatt in the end of the 50s. So this is probably the most simple neural network that you can imagine, which takes a d-dimensional vector input, multiplies by some vector of weights, sums uh, everything up and passes it through a nonlinear activation function, such as some form of a step, right? And uh, basically this is the, the, as simple as it can be. Now, if you combine just uh, two such units, you can approximate, you can represent step functions. Once you can represent step functions, you can approximate any function, any continuous function to any desired accuracy. So we call this property the universal approximation. And well, you can say that uh, the class of functions that are represented by these networks is dense in the space of continuous functions. And in a sense, it's a good piece of news because, well, this network is very expressive. It can represent uh, more or less anything. But of course, it also is a bad piece of news because this is a very weak inductive bias. And where it comes into the into the play is if you consider real world uh, high dimensional uh, data such as uh, problems in computer vision as simple as a digit classification. So the way that you would uh, approach this problem with uh, this simple minded uh, perceptron is just stack your image as a vector, let's say as a column, and feed it into this uh, neural network. The problem is that if I just shifted my image by one pixel it's still the same digit just displaced by one position, the input will be very different. And as a result, I will need uh, a lot of data to teach the network that these are the same digits. So I will uh, need to learn invariance to these shifts from the data. And this appears to be impossible uh, due to the uh, curse of dimensionality. The number of examples that you need to show to the neural network will be so large that probably will exceed the number of atoms in the universe. So this really never worked. And this was one of the complaints when people uh, in the 60s or the 70s tried to apply neural networks to, to even very simple problems of image classification. So the, uh, the paradigm shift uh, came from uh, initial works that were inspired by uh, the, the study of uh, uh, the, the 
the, the neuroscience of the, the connectivity of the visual cortex, the seminal works of Hubel and Wiesel that, that brought them the Nobel Prize in medicine in uh, 1981. And this idea that uh, you can uh, create local connectivity of what uh, uh, was called receptive fields and uh, an architecture that had all the modern elements with maybe the exception of back propagation was the neocognitron of Fukushima. He actually, for example, if you read the paper, he used the sign activated, sorry, the relo activation function that is considered to be a kind of modern stuff, but it's, it was already used in 1980. And uh, the architecture that is uh, useful nowadays and was uh, uh, the, the pioneering work was uh, the convolutional neural network of uh, Jan Lecon and, and co -authors. And uh, basically it takes advantage of self similar structures of the images at different scales and uh, considers neural network as a set of local operations with shared weights, which is important to reduce the number of degrees of freedom and to make the, 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 the learning actually uh, uh, computationally tractable. And it's implemented in the form of convolutional filters and pooling uh, that uh, together give uh, at least roughly uh, some form of shift invariance. So computationally, the number of parameters, importantly, is independent on the image size, and the complexity is linear in the size of the image. Okay, so we'll return uh, many times to these uh, important computational properties. So if we look at it as uh, a form of inductive bias, so this departure from uh, universal approxima uh, approximators, uh, the multi-layer perceptrons, to uh, architectures that are uh, that are, uh, are tailored for the specific invariants that we have in images was really one of the keys to the success of uh, deep learning in, in computer vision using convolutional neural networks. And these ideas can be extended. So you can extend, for example, convolutional neural networks to be invariant to, to rotations and to other geometric transformations. So that's exactly the spirit of what we are trying to do in geometric deep learning, basically to, uh, to find uh, the right inductive biases for these problems. So let me show you a very different example. So this is a molecule of caffeine that uh, probably I need to replenish uh, this morning. So this is a graph. Right? So you have uh, uh, nodes that represent atoms and edges represent chemical bonds. And if you were to predict some property of this uh, molecule, let's say the atomization energy, which is uh, a crucial step in, for example, virtual drug screening, if you want to quickly tell whether this molecule uh, will, will have certain properties or not. The way you can do it, of course, as before, you can just uh, collect these uh, features of the atoms, uh, stack them into a vector and pass them into a neural network. But now the number of ways you can do it is uh, much larger than we had with images, because usually you don't have an economical ordering of the nodes of a graph. And this already brings forth a different type of invariants that we would like uh, to see for these kind of problems. And it appears, especially uh, more recently, that graphs uh, are really ubiquitous in a lot of problems. Uh, perhaps social networks are the most prominent example, which operate with humongous uh, uh, graphs of hundreds of millions of nodes and, and, and billions of edges representing users and their interactions. But you can also find them in biological networks, what is called interactomes that represent interactions between different biochemical entities, such as proteins, drugs, metabolites, and so on. Uh, in problems in computer vision and graphics, it's convenient to model 3D shapes as meshes, which is kind of uh, graphs with more structure. In medical imaging, we can find different uh, functional networks of the brain, for example, and so on and so forth. Really, graphs are ubiquitous because they are mathematical abstractions for systems of relations and interactions. So the term geometric deep learning, well, it's a made up word that, that somehow uh, caught up. Uh, uh, it uh, uh, dates back to, to, uh, to, to a paper that, that I co-authored with, uh, with Jean Bruna, Jan Lecon, uh, Arthur Schlamm, and Pierre van der Gains, where we try to connect a, a few disparate uh, um, ideas and, and some, some prior work that existed in different fields, whether it's in uh, graph signal processing or uh, computer graphics and geometry processing. And uh, we gave it this title, Geometric Deep Learning. So I should say that I first wrote it for my ERC grant in 2015, where uh, on this landscape where everyone started doing deep learning, somehow you need to brand yourself differently. So I said, let's call it Geometric Deep Learning. So uh, it sounds different. And, and somehow it, it, uh, it, it remained as a common term, but you can also see uh, 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 terms such as graph representation learning or relational inductive biases from the famous paper of, uh, of 
Peter Bataille uh, from DeepMind. And graph neural networks are particular instances that implement these uh, kind of inductive biases. So the two objects that uh, we, we like to consider in this field are manifolds and graphs. So there are more, but uh, I, I would like to focus on these two primarily on graphs. And if you think uh, in terms of the, the underlying mathematics, it's even hard to imagine uh, less similar uh, stuff than, than manifolds and graphs, right? So if you, if you look at uh, experts in these respective domains, uh, manifolds are studied by differential geometers and graphs are studied by uh, either graph theorists or computer scientists. And usually they don't even sit on the same floor or in the same department. Maybe they even quietly hate each other and don't go to the same conferences. But nevertheless, I hope I will convince you that at least from some perspectives, these two objects are very similar. And we can try to generalize uh, convolutional networks or similar architectures to both graphs and manifolds. So let me start with graphs. And basically one of the issues when we compare uh, our way of working with images to our way with, uh, of working with graphs, uh, one thing that we see in images is that uh, if I look at uh, a region around a pixel, right, a patch of pixels, we always have a, a fixed number of neighbors. On graphs, on the other hand, uh, what we call the no degree can be very different. So on social networks, uh, some popular users might have millions or tens of millions of followers, and uh, normal people might have just, uh, just very few. Uh, another thing that is also important that the ordering of neighbors is fixed in images and different in graphs. It's arbitrary in graphs. Therefore, the type of invariance that we'll get will be very different. And what I will try to show today is how to define something similar to convolution on graphs, how to do pooling, which are the two key ingredients of convolutional neural networks, and everything must be also done efficiently so we can somehow replicate the success of CNNs on images on uh, 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 irregularly structured domains. So for this purpose, let me start with convolution. And if we look at convolutional neural networks, just the, 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 the filter part of the, of the convolutional layer, Basically, you can think of it as uh, some linear transformation from uh, an input vector to the output vector. And what is important that uh, usually it is sparsely connected. So one output is connected to just a few inputs and the weights are shared. So if you look at the matrix that represents the weights of the convolutional layer, we see that it, it has this multi-diagonal structure, right? So in this case, you see that the number of parameters is independent on the input size. The input can be of any size. Here we have just three parameters. Now, if you look at it as a matrix vector equation, this is a very special uh, uh, matrix. It has uh, uh, what is called a circle structure. So it can be obtained by shifted versions of a vector that we call W with some boundary conditions that we assume here to be periodic, right? So an equivalent way of thinking of convolutions is, uh, uh, is of circle matrices. So we can parameterize them by this vector W. Now, what we know from linear algebra that uh, matrix multiplication is not commutative, but this is not the case for uh, circular matrices. They actually do commute. And uh, if we pick up a special circular matrix, what we call the shift operator, which is uh, just shifting the uh, elements of a vector by one position, right? So this would be uh, what is called the right, uh, right shift or left shift. Yeah. Um, so convolution, uh, because convolutions commute, in particular, they commute with shift. So this is a property that we call shift equivariance. So equivariance means that the output changes the same way as the input. You will find many uh, references where it's called shift invariance, which is incorrect. Uh, shift invariance means that the output is unaffected by shift. Okay. So what we, we also know about, uh, about um, circle matrices, uh, because they commute, they also are jointly diagonalizable, meaning that in this case, they will have the same eigenvectors. It's convenient to look at the eigenvectors of one matrix, because we know that they all will be the same. And actually, if we look at the shift matrix, we'll, we can analytically compute its eigenvectors and see that these are exactly the sines and cosines or the complex exponentials that form the standard Fourier basis. And therefore, when we say that convolution is diagonalized by the Fourier transform or the discrete Fourier transform, it's exactly this, that basically these are the eigenvectors of, uh, of convolutions or circle matrices. And therefore, it is convenient to think of them uh, with, uh, represent them as uh, their Fourier coefficients. So one uh, missing piece of the puzzle is to show that the eigenvalues 
in this representation are actually given by the Fourier transform of this vector W. And here we have the recipe that is called the convolution theorem and signal processing that we have a duality between two ways of computing convolution. We can compute it either as a circulant matrix applied to, to our uh, vector X, or we can first compute the Fourier transform, then do element-wise product because now everything is diagonalized, so we can just multiply diagonal matrices and then compute the inverse Fourier transform. And the result will be the same. Okay, so we have this duality, these two ways of thinking of convolution as a spatial domain operation or the frequency domain operation. Okay, so let me summarize it. I hope that this was uh, that this was uh, 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 just a repetition of some known facts, but uh, I hope that you also see here that we derive convolution from first principles because we just didn't say that uh, this is a sliding window operation where you reflect your filter. Right, it comes out naturally from this translation invariance principle. So we we define it as a linear operation that commutes with shift, and you can show that uh, defined in this way, convolution is the only thing that commutes with shift that is linear. So basically, convolution emerges automatically from translation equivariance, from translation symmetry. That's exactly uh, how we try to be faithful to the, the these ideas of Klein's Erlang and program to to derive quantities uh, from the way that they are preserved. So to summarize, conversion in spatial domain is a circular matrix. You can alternatively think of it as a kind of local aggregation on adjacent nodes with shared parameters. Uh, the, uh, this special structure comes from the underlying grid structure. And the alternative way is to consider the fact that all circular matrices or all convolutions are diagonalized by the discrete Fourier transform, which happen to be eigenvectors of the shift matrix or any other uh, circular matrix. And conversion and frequency domain can be done by first applying DFT, then element-wise product, and then inverse DFT. Okay, and we also know that we can compute it efficiently. If the filter is small, usually it will be done as a sliding window with uh, order of n operations. If the filter is large, if we design it in the frequency domain, as it's common in one-dimensional signal processing, we can uh, use the redundancy in the uh, discrete Fourier transform matrix, which gives rise to multiple fast Fourier transform algorithms. Uh, that have n log n complexity, which for any practical purpose is almost as good as order of n. Okay, so now we move from grids to graphs. And uh, just what you need to know about graphs that this is a collection of uh, nodes and edges, right? The edges can be ordered. In this case, the graph is directed or unordered. In this case, the graph is undirected. Uh, when we talk about the neighborhood of a node, it's just uh, the, all the nodes that are connected by an edge to it. And the degree will be the size of the neighborhood. Okay, we also want uh, to work with attributed graphs, so we'll usually assume that we have some node features of dimension D that can be organized in this matrix X of size uh, N by D. And uh, same way, we can also talk about edge features, which uh, for convenience, uh, we can think of them as just uh, some non-negative weights on the, uh, the edges of the graph. And the graph can be, uh, the structure of the graph can be represented by the adjacency matrix where in the position IJ, if we have an edge, uh, we put uh, its weight and we put zero otherwise, right? So that's basically one-to-one -one representation of the structure of the graph. Now, we also see that if the graph is undirected, the adjacency matrix is symmetric. We'll see in a second why this might be important, okay? And another important construction that, that you often see in uh, literature on graph signal processing or in uh, deep learning on graphs is what is called the graph Laplacian. So what the Laplacian operator does, the classical Laplacian, the second order derivative from calculus, essentially it's a kind of local difference operator. So it looks at your neighborhood, which in the continuous calculus is uh, infinitesimal circle, averages your function on this neighborhood and subtracts it from the value of the function at the point. So on a graph, that's exactly what you do. So you take the feature at node i and subtract from it the average of the features in the adjacent nodes in the one, uh, one hop neighborhood. Okay, and you can write it as a matrix vector operation. So the Laplacian matrix uh, or L Laplacian matrix, because there are many ways of defining it, can be given in this form. In this form, A is the adjacency matrix, D is uh, the diagonal matrix containing the degree of each node, and I is the identity. Okay, so one thing that you can do with the Laplacian is to measure how smooth the signal is on the graph. Right, basically, uh, the difference between yourself and your neighbors tells you how much uh, the signal changes when I move from uh, from a node to, to an adjacent node. And this is what physicists call the Dirichlet energy. It's given by this quadratic form. And 
this actually gives rise to another way of thinking of the Fourier basis on graphs or on grids as the smoothest orthogonal basis. Basically, you can obtain it as a minimization of this uh, energy with respect to some orthogonal uh, matrices X. I should say that Laplacian is really ubiquitous. You find it everywhere. You can define it in a lot of uh, different and bizarre structures. You can define it even on metric spaces. In particular, in differential geometry, it's called the Laplace Beltrami operator. So it's uh, a non Euclidean version of the Laplacian. And uh, when manifolds are discretized as meshes, there are several discretizations, the most popular of which is probably the cotangent uh, formula that is shown here. And uh, basically, equipped with this, we can now. Uh, proceed with defining convolutional graphs, right? And we've seen two ways of doing it in the Euclidean domain, so we'll follow exactly these two ways, and I hope that I will convince you at some point that the two uh, perspectives are equivalent. So we've seen uh, that one way was uh, the spatial way, uh, using local aggregation on adjacent nodes with shared parameters, and the second way, way was using the Fourier transform, which on graphs has to be replaced with the graph Fourier transform. Okay, so let me start with this uh, spectral uh, definition of convolution. And allow me to bring you uh, for a second back to one dimensional grid. So, one dimensional grid is just a particular version of a graph, what is called the ring graph. So, we assume that we have periodic boundary conditions. So, it's a graph that looks like this. So, where uh, uh, node three is connected to node two, node two is connected to node one, and then node one is connected to node n. Okay, so if you look at the adjacency matrix of this graph, we see that it looks exactly like, like the shift operator that we've seen before, right? So this is the adjacency of this graph. And the key idea that, that tries to generalize graph, uh, uh, the Fourier transform construction to graphs is to use the eigenvectors of the adjacency matrix or for, for, the, the, for the sake of this discussion, it can be actually any other matrix. So another popular alternative is the graph of Plassen. You can use their eigenvectors as the analogy of the Fourier basis or the Fourier transform. And the two constructions are obviously equivalent on greens because uh, adjacency matrix uh, and, uh, and Laplacian are all circuit matrices. Uh, so they, they all have the same eigenvectors, but on graphs, uh, you will get somewhat different, but at least philosophically uh, similar constructions. So if the graphs are undirected, we have symmetric adjacency or uh, Laplacian. So they naturally have orthogonal like vectors. If the graph is directed, then the construction is more complex and uh, allow me to skip it for the sake of simplicity. So for the, for the time being, let us consider on the undirected graphs. Okay, so this is how the Fourier basis looks like. So these are the first eigenvectors of the ring graph Laplacian. So this is the, the, the standard Fourier basis of uh, sinusoids of different frequency. And this is an example of some arbitrary graph. So this is a road network, I think, in the state of Minnesota. And you see it's first eigenvector. So the first eigenvector is uh, has a corresponding eigenvalue zero. So this is what's called in signal processing the DC component. So it's constant. And then uh, here are the blue and the red colors represent positive and negative values. As we go to higher frequencies, to, uh, uh, eigenvalues in increasing order, we see more oscillations. So kind, kind of frequency of these eigenvectors increases. So here is a recipe for doing convolution in the frequency domain on graphs or on any uh, construction where we can build the Laplacian and then diagonalize it. Uh, basically, to compute convolution of x with w, we first compute the graph Fourier transform of x by projecting x on this orthogonal basis of the graph uh, Laplacian or just the symmetric eigenvectors. Then we apply the filter, where the filter is designed already in the frequency domain. So the filter is defined by this. Uh, spectral coefficients w hat, and then we compute the inverse Fourier transform, multiplying again by this uh, uh, orthogonal basis uh, matrix. Okay, so so far it's, it looks exactly the same. So in case of a one-dimensional grid, this will be the standard Fourier transform operation, and this will be the inverse Fourier transform operation. The difference comes in the complexity primarily. So computing uh, the Fourier transform on a graph we usually don't have this luxury of the redundancy that we have in DFT. So there are no fast Fourier, uh, uh, Fourier transform algorithms on graphs. So it's just a dense matrix that you multiply by a vector, which costs your n squared operations. And I'm not talking about computing the eigenvectors themselves, because this would typically cost you order of n cube or slightly less. I think it's n to the power 2.7 something. Uh, 
Then, of course, applying the filter is order of n, and then the inverse Fourier transform is exactly the same complexity as the Fourier Fourier transform. So this is really bad, right? So this is uh, computationally intractable even for rather mid-sized graph graphs. And uh, if we compare it to the classical setting of, of grids, there we had order of n, or maybe worst case, uh, n log n complexity. The second thing to, no to notice here is that the number of parameters is order of n, right? So these are the coefficients that, that we need to optimize for. So if we do uh, learning, uh, basically, if we use this definition of spectral convolution in our definition of convolutional layer, then really we have number of parameters dependent on the nodes, the number of nodes of the graph, as opposed to uh, order of one in the classical case. So there is also no guarantee of spatial localization. We design our uh, filters in the Fourier domain, so we don't know how they look like in, on the nodes of the graph. The filters are isotropic, so there is no uh, natural notion of direction. I will say a few words why, but you can already imagine why. In images, uh, images are two-dimensional grids that can be thought of as uh, tensor products of one-dimensional grids. So all the constructions, including the Laplacian or the adjacency matrix, the eigenvectors, they can all be factored into basically tensor product of one-dimensional uh, 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 one-dimensional Fourier basis. And as a result, we have a, a, a very natural notion of uh, two-dimensional frequency of horizontal and vertical frequency. On graphs, it's not clear how to do it. So the, the, the best thing we can do, well, there are some constructions, but typically what you do, you just order the eigenvectors uh, in the order of the corresponding eigenvalues, so increasing eigenvalues. Therefore, the structure of the frequency domain is one-dimensional. We don't have this natural notion of of, uh, uh, of multi-dimensional frequency. And the worst thing is that filters are basis dependent. So if I learn a filter on one graph and then I try to apply it to another graph, it will usually not work. And let me show you an example of uh, how this looks like. So in this case, I have a mesh which has some uh, function that is defined on it. So these uh, red spots are ones and the gray parts are zeros. And if I apply some spectral filter, let's say that does uh, some form of edge detection, I will do it in the spectral domain, right? So I will project the uh, signal on the orthogonal basis. Then I will apply the, the filter coefficients and then I compute the inverse Fourier transform, okay? So, so far, looks good. What happens if I slightly deform this horse shape? So uh, the graph will change a little bit. The Laplacian will change a little bit. The eigenvectors will change. If I keep the same coefficients, but apply them in a different basis, I will get completely different results. So that, that's exactly what I mean, that, that it doesn't generalize. So it's not stable under the perturbation of the underlying domain, okay? So the second problem that I mentioned is that filters are isotropic on graphs. And this has to do with the fact that we, on grids, we do have a, a canonical ordering of the pixels. So I can always say that I have a, a pixel to the left and a pixel to the right. So I can order them in a certain way. And then when I do the weight sharing, when I apply the filter, I always apply the same weight to the same neighbor. On graphs, we don't have this luxury because I can order my neighbors in any arbitrary way, right? So necessarily the way that I apply the filter must be uh, oblivious to the ordering of the neighbors. And this is uh, what we call local permutation invariance. So there is no direction on graphs. And if you look at the Laplacian, it is oblivious to directions, right? So it averages. So some form of permutation invariant aggregation is what you typically do as a form of aggregating messages on, on, on graphs when you do this kind of uh, message passing or diffusion. We'll talk about it in a second. Okay, so I, I should say there are some constructions uh, how to do anisotropic diffusion on, on graphs, but uh, they are not very commonplace. On manifolds, the situation is uh, more optimistic because manifolds are not just any graphs. They have local Euclidean structure. So in particular, if we're talking about meshes or two-dimensional surfaces, uh, we still have an, uh, some ambiguity. So we can fix any of the uh, nodes as the first node. But once I do it, I can order all the rest of the nodes in, let's say, clockwise order. So uh, in, the, in this case, instead of permutation ambiguity, we have rotation ambiguity. And there is more structure. So manifolds are somehow more hopeful uh, uh, candidates for, uh, uh, for uh, more interesting filters. And you can see that we can do an isotropic diffusion on manifolds that, that, that has a certain notion of direction. OK, so let's take uh, another take on this uh, problem. And we can now think of uh, convolution, what we've seen before as a spectral convolution, as some kind of uh, 
matrix function that is applied to the Laplacian. And when I say that it's when we apply a function to a matrix, we understand it as a function applied in an operator sense. So we apply it to uh, the eigenvalues of the operator or the matrix, like written here. And if we interpret the eigenvalues uh, of the Laplacian or uh, as frequencies, uh, we can think of this function as some spectral transfer function. So some kind of filter, uh, continuous function that we apply to, 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 to the spectrum uh, uh, of our signal. And if we make it parametric with fixed number of parameters, we resolve the problem of uh, having order of n of uh, parameters that we need to optimize for. Furthermore, if we make it expressible in terms of simple matrix operations, such as uh, powers or matrix vector multiplications, we don't actually need to explicitly diagonalize the Laplacian to compute the basis. I will show an example in a second. We also can guarantee stability under graph perturbations. So there are several works. One of them was done with uh, my collaborator, Ron Levy, uh, uh, a few years ago. And we can also guarantee some form of uh, localization. So we can show, for example, that the filters uh, on the, in the node domain have an exponentially fast decay. So they're really, if not compact, at least they're localized. OK. So the simplest choice of this function is a polynomial. So this is uh, also a very popular uh, paper, seminal paper by Michael de Ferrar from the group of Pierre van der Geinst from 2016. And uh, they proposed to use uh, Chebyshev polynomials or for the sake of this discussion, any polynomial would do where the, uh, this uh, spectral transfer function looks like a polynomial of degree P. The number of parameters is the degree of the polynomial. It's independent on the si uh, size of the graph. And it's efficiently computable because when you apply it, you just need to take powers of the Laplacian or your adjacency matrix. You don't need to compute the Fourier transform altogether, right? You don't need to explicitly diagonalize the Laplacian. Now, why it's efficiently computable? Because Laplacian usually will be a sparse matrix. It has uh, the number of non-zeros as the number of edges in the graph. And if the graph is sparsely connected, it is roughly the, the number of nodes. So it's order of n, right? And we can see it from here. These are the non-zeros of the, the Laplacian matrix. Uh, and it also automatically gives you localization of the filters because Laplacian is a local operator. It affects one hop neighbors. If you take a power P of the Laplacian, it will affect only P times uh, removed uh, neighbors. So that's why the filters are localized. But then you can show that it's stable under a graph perturbation. So you can generalize it uh, across different domains. And it, it really doesn't uh, rely anymore on this assumption that the graph is uh, undirected because we don't explicitly diagonalize it. So it can be used with any matrix. It's just a matrix polynomial. OK. So this brings us to the second perspective on uh, uh, convolution type operations on graphs, which is the spatial domain definition. And again, let me go back to the grid. We've seen that the adjacency matrix of the, uh, of the green graph that models one dimensional grid with periodic boundary conditions is the shift operator. And the way that we can write convolutions on grids, you remember this multi-diagonal uh, matrix, we can write it as uh, shift the signal and then multiply it by some weight and then sum up the weighted versions of the shifted signal. Right? So that's another way of thinking of convolution. So you can think of it as a linear combination of the powers of the adjacency matrix, where right? power zero is the identity. Right. So if you write it, we get back exactly the same polynomial filter that we've seen before. Now I apply it to the adjacency matrix instead of the Laplacian, but the idea is exactly the same, right? So you see that the two views, uh, the spatial convolution and the spectral convolution are exactly the same, same way as we had it in the, uh, in the classical setting. So basically here, we don't really, uh, we, we don't care how this adjacency matrix looks like, right? So it's just adjacency matrix of any graph. Uh, and you can think of uh, adjacency matrix as a kind of shift operation. So it's a way of propagating information from your node to your neighbors. So another way of thinking of convolution of graphs is a kind of diffusion process. And uh, probably this was epitomized in the famous work of Kipf and Welling uh, that they call a, the graph convolutional networks. You can think of it as a particular setting of the previous uh, polynomial filters where they say the following things. So uh, these are my uh, node feature, uh, uh, node features arranged into a matrix, right? So each row represents uh, the feature vector of, of one node. So we can do two things to this matrix. We can transform 
the features uh, independently node-wise and in the simplest manner this can be done by just write-wise multiplication of this matrix by this uh, learnable uh, green matrix right so basically we linearly transform uh, each feature of the node in the same way and then we can diffuse the information on the graph so we can multiply from the left by some uh, by some graph diffusion operator it can be adjacency matrix it can be laplace and and usually it's some form of adjacency matrix with self loops where it can uh, allow to add back the feature of the node itself okay and this gives rise probably to the simplest implementation of convolution like filter on a graph so you have the uh, the node wise transformation the diffusion and then some form of non-linearity and you can concatenate such uh, convolutional layers multiple times and here is for example a, a two layer graph convolutional network that does some uh, node classification so the, the output will be a softmax that uh, categorizes nodes in let's say two classes okay so that's probably as simple as it can be so if we go back again to what we wanted to do on images and what we wanted to do on graphs now we do have analogies between uh, operations uh, uh, in classical convolutional networks and in graphs uh, the principles are similar the implementation are different so instead of convolution we have some form of message passing or diffusion instead of operating with local windows we operate in local uh, 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 one hop neighborhoods we have the difference that the number of neighbors is different uh, the order of neighbors is arbitrary and as a result the, the the kind of invariance or inductive bias that we get with graph uh, conversional networks is very different allow me to skip the pooling uh, and let's look again at the conversion so what i described here is really the simplest recipe for doing convolutional graphs basically it's linear transformation of the uh, of the feature matrix so i do some diffusion by a constant matrix that in the, is independent of the features and this is how the early work such as uh, the, the polynomial filters or gcn worked you can make things slightly more complicated you can make uh, it's still a linear combination of the features in adjacent nodes but now make the the combination uh, coefficients dependent on the features themselves so uh, the first implementation of this idea was in our work that we call uh, uh, monet or mixture model networks which created a kind of local chart or local system of coordinates in which we aggregated uh, the, the the features of the adjacent nodes probably somewhat more popular implementation is the graph attention network which uh, uh, aggregates the nodes with weights that depend on the features of uh, of the, the endpoints of an edge now the most general way of aggregating uh, information on graphs is some non-linear transformation of the of the nodes and uh, the, the the standard architecture that implements it is uh, the message passing neural network that was introduced by justin gilmer in 2017 and this is the kind of architecture that they use so it has two operations it has the aggregation function that uh, aggregates information from uh, the uh, from the neighbors and then an update function that updates the current node so this is a kind of non-linear diffusion importantly the update must be permutation or sorry the aggregation must be permutation invariant because we don't have canonical way of ordering the neighbors so usually it's a maximum sum or mean okay but if we look slightly more attentively at the way that these aggregation operations look like we see that actually it is hugely important how we choose it so if i look at aggregation uh, this is my central node that is shown here in black if i have these neighbors uh, here the colors represent the same features uh, with the maximum function i cannot distinguish between these uh, two constructions right because maximum doesn't care about how many nodes with the same feature i have on the other hand with mean i will be able to distinguish between them but if i look at these two graphs uh, you see that each node here appears twice so the mean will be exactly the same but the sum will be different and this brings the question is actually what is the right choice of these functions and maybe somewhat differently more broadly formulated is how powerful are graph neural networks what is their expressive power and this is a more difficult question because uh, in the classical case we could consider this as a problem of function approximation so we have a fixed domain and we just uh, need to represent some class of functions on this domain in case of uh, graphs uh, we, we want to represent both the structure of the graph and the features on the graph and then uh, what what's the expressive power can be defined in these in these terms so uh, a popular way of uh, formulating this question is to relate it to the graph isomorphism test and uh, two graphs are said to be isomorphic if 
there exists uh, an edge preserving bijection between them. So in other words, we can permute their adjacency matrices and get the same thing. So they're defined up to ordering of their, of their nodes. And it's interesting that actually it is not even known what is the complexity of this problem of establishing if two graphs are isomorphic. We uh, don't have any polynomial time algorithm yet, but we know that it's not in P-complete. So usually it's classified in uh, its own complexity class that is called GI, graph isomorphism. And the classical resulting graph theory, uh, 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 the heuristic that is now known as the weisfeller lehmann test, was actually an attempt to, to develop a polynomial time testing algorithm for graphs, um, which came actually from motivations uh, from computational chemistry, from uh, virtual screening of, of molecules. And uh, uh, Lehmann and Weisfeller uh, uh, thought that they, they invented the polynomial time test that was then disproved by a counterexample. And the way that it works is a kind of color refinement scheme. So you start with discrete labels that you can represent by colors. So each node is colored in the same way. And then you refine the colors using the neighbors. So the neighbors are represented as multisets. So multiset is a set where the same element can appear multiple times. So here, for example, the multiset of this node will be these uh, two, uh, uh, these three neighbors, right, as shown here. And the multiset of this uh, node will be just these two neighbors. If I then uh, apply some hash function that is injective, I will obtain different colors to these nodes. And I can repeat this process again, obtaining another uh, color refinement. But then at some point, the colors will stop changing. So at this point, I will stop the algorithm and uh, output the distribution of different colors. And this is a kind of graph descriptor. So if I apply the same process for another graph and I get different descriptors, I can terminate and say that the graphs are non-isomorphic for sure. But if the distributions are the same, I don't know. They are possibly isomorphic. So in other words, this is a necessary but insufficient condition. And in fact, we can find very simple examples of graphs which are not isomorphic, but the Weisfeller lemon test will uh, produce uh, the same coloring. So we can say that in this case, the WL test fails. And the simplest example is shown here. Uh, what is uh, uh, what, what was shown that the WL test cannot detect triangles. So as simple structures as triangles. So you cannot count them. So as a result, it will not distinguish between these two structures. And uh, there are higher dimensional uh, versions of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the device. Service. What was shown in two uh, uh, concurrent works in 2019, that message passing with the right choice of injective uh, aggregation function is equivalent to the WL test. So in this sense, message passing graph neural networks are as powerful as the WL test. So we already can think of the expressive power in these in this terms. And since there the, the exist strictly more powerful k-dimensional WL tests that operate on k-tuples of nodes, uh, you can also develop uh, equivalent k-dimensional graph neural networks. The problem is that their complexity is very high. So they're not really uh, practical. So the, the, the best, for example, GNN that is uh, equivalent to three WLs has, uh, has a cubic time complexity. This is work of uh, Hagai Marom from Weizmann Institute. So it's good for proving theorems, but it's not good for uh, any practical purpose. So a somewhat different way of approaching this problem is to do uh, uh, what we call uh, structure encoding. And it is a little bit similar to positional encoding that is used in, uh, in sequential models. Basically, if we know that the WL test or message passing cannot uh, detect uh, certain structures, let's count them uh, as pre-processing step and pass them as descriptors uh, attached to each node or each edge. And once we do it, we can pass these extra features uh, to the message passing. So the good thing that we retain the local and linear uh, structure of the message passing algorithm, the price we pay is in this pre-computation, counting substructures. So in the worst case, if the graph is fully connected, detecting uh, substructures of size k could cost us n to the power k, which is equivalent complexity of the high dimensional WL test. But in practice, because the graphs are not fully connected and we have certain structure that can be counted more efficiently, usually it is way lower, as lower as linear uh, in some cases. And uh, this is really, I think, a, a big difference because we absorb all the nasty computational complexity in the, in the, uh, the pre-computation that usually actually doesn't cost us as much. And then the uh, neural network is, uh, uh, is very lightweight. The training and the inference is, is very simple. 
Uh, we also have at least empirical evidence that it generalizes better, but this is a, a completely different story that, that has not been addressed properly in the literature yet. So we can show that it's strictly more powerful than the WO test. And usually it's shown by counterexample. So you can show that, for example, that it's uh, not less powerful than three WO tests by counterexample of these uh, non isomorphic graphs that three WO tests cannot distinguish because it cannot count uh, four clicks. So one of these graphs has four clicks and another graph has only three angles. So they are uh, three WL equivalent, but they are not isomorphic. So the three WL test will fail. But if we pre-count the clicks and provide them as uh, structural descriptors to our graph subtraction networks, we will be able to distinguish between them. So, and this brings us again to this uh, idea of uh, problem-specific inductive bias, where uh, if we know that in certain problems, certain structures matter, like in social networks, for example, uh, these are typically uh, triangles or cliques, or in chemical uh, data sets, these are cycles. Uh, we can introduce this into the architecture by, in this way, by maybe this naive way of counting structures, and we usually get significantly better results. So this is, sorry, I got to, to the wrong slide, apologies for that. Yeah, sorry. Um, sorry for, for this technical issue. Yeah, so if we look at um, uh, molecular data sets where we try to do virtual screening of molecules to predict their chemical and physical properties, uh, molecules are abundant with, for example, ring structures. So aromatic, uh, aromatic rings uh, or uh, uh, rings of uh, consisting of five uh, atoms or six atoms, uh, they're very common in organic molecules. And uh, we see that if we, uh, if we pre-count these structures and provide them as this form of inductive bias, we get significant improvement in predicting the molecular properties. And I should emphasize that this is a generic architecture. So it's not custom tailored to, to molecules. So we just apply it as is out of the box and it works on par with uh, some of the best uh, uh, architectures optimized for this uh, particular chemical problem. So I think I'm more or less out of time. So let me uh, say a few words about uh, what's next. So uh, if you think of one of the key uh, uh, drivers for uh, the success of uh, deep learning in conventional networks in particular in computer vision was standardized benchmarks and computations such as image that. So uh, we, all, we already have something like this for graphs that is called open graph benchmark. I would say that the problems in graph uh, learning are much more varied than uh, in case of images. We have uh, uh, problems dealing with very small graphs or very large graphs, problems where we want to classify nodes or where we want to predict edges. The graphs can be static or can be dynamic. So it's really, uh, uh, a zoo of different problems and different data sets. Software libraries is also important. This is what really democratized deep learning, the availability of, uh, of software packages such as TensorFlow or PyTorch. We already have something like this for uh, uh, deep learning on graphs as well. Uh, to get industrial adoption, we need to address problems of efficiency and scalability. So we want to develop graph neural networks that can run in real time on graphs with uh, hundreds of millions of nodes. And uh, I would say these works are very few still, even though there is already industrial adoption, probably Pinterest was one of the early adopters of this uh, technology for the recommender systems. But now uh, multiple companies, well, including Twitter, are working on, uh, on uh, using graph neural networks in production. Uh, in uh, Twitter, Facebook, and, and other social networks, one of the key characteristics of the graphs that they change over time. So we need to deal with dynamic graphs. Uh, maybe going beyond uh, simple naive message passing, considering higher order structures. So this makes interesting connections to topological data analysis and looking at uh, construction such as persistent homologies. In some cases, we actually don't know the graph. So uh, we want to learn this from the data, to build it on the fly maybe, to optimize it for the downstream problem. And this is an interesting problem because we see that in certain types of graphs, message passing is extremely inefficient. So this happens when uh, we need uh, long range dependencies. So we need information from distant nodes, but the number of neighbors grows exponentially fast. Uh, 
which happens in small uh, uh, small world graphs. So message passing basically encounters this bottleneck where we need to squeeze a lot of information into a single uh, node feature vector, and therefore it doesn't work efficiently. So that's that's why, for example, uh, deep graph neural networks are much more difficult to construct than the uh, conventional architectures. So uh, in uh, uh, and the recent trend is to rewire the graph that. Uh, or use a different graph for message passing that is different from the uh, input graph that is provided on which uh, the features uh, the features live and uh, basically theoretically principled way of choosing such graphs is not fully understood and in which cases uh, they should be done and in which cases this should not be done there are interesting problems uh, uh, in the theory of graph neural networks as well uh, uh, problems such as performance guarantees and robustness what, for example, Stefan Guniman is doing uh, adversarial perturbations of graph neural networks. Uh, I would say that uh, in parallel to uh, the expressive power, which is also an open question, how actually to define expressive power of graph neural networks, uh, I think graph isomorphism is a rather limited setting. Uh, the, the, the elephant in the room is really the generalization power rather than expressive power, and this has uh, almost not been addressed. In the literature so this is a big uh, open question there and last but not least are killer apps and uh, this is really where i think uh, in the past uh, couple of years we see uh, graph neural networks uh, spread uh, widely and have uh, produced a uh, metastasis if i were use a, a, a cancer analogy uh, over different fields and uh, one of the most popular uh, uh, trends in uh, in machine learning in the past in the past year, I think this year as well, one of the most popular keywords in iClear submissions. And uh, it's not surprising, as I mentioned, uh, graphs are really natural models uh, for systems of relations and interactions. And uh, you can apply them really at all scales from uh, uh, macroscopic scales as modeling social networks or behavior of entire populations to uh, microscopic scales, uh, for example, different interactions of uh, uh, biomolecules in our body to modeling the molecules themselves. And I would say these are probably the most promising applications, applications in social networks where we uh, hopefully in the next few years we'll see wide adoption of these methods uh, by the industry, by the, the companies uh, like Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter and, and others, but uh, also in the pharmaceutical industry for the development of new drugs and repurposing of existing drugs by uh, looking at uh, our body and the, uh, the the effect of drugs as a network system, because the uh, old ideas or the classical approach to, to, to drug therapy of uh, associating uh, a disease with one biological target and developing one molecule that will affect this target is already obsolete. We know that diseases are manifested in uh, different, uh, for example, uh, expressions of, of, of genes that are uh, related to different protein targets. And then even one drug that, that targets a single target usually binds to something like 50 different proteins on average. So uh, it's really a complex network problem. We touch in one place and there is a, a, a ripple effect uh, through the entire interactome. So addressing uh, these modeling and, and uh, uh, addressing these, uh, these effects is extremely important. And uh, I, I would hope at least to see that in the next uh, couple of years, we'll see uh, the first results of using uh, geometric deep learning in, in these problems. Uh, let me maybe just show some uh, examples where it is already being used. So uh, earlier this year, there was a paper from, uh, uh, from Collins at MIT where they used graph neural networks for virtual screening of molecules uh, to find new uh, antibiotic candidates. So basically a new class of drugs discovered using graph neural networks. How cool is that? And one of the, the reasons why to do it is to dramatically reduce the search space size to uh, basically to, by virtual screening of, of candidates uh, that then could be tested in the lab. And the, the, probably the more interesting part of it is some kind of feedback loop that allows to then uh, feed in the experimental data and uh, optimize the, uh, the, 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 the search space for, for this. Uh, uh, in light of these experiments. So I think I ran out of time, so I will probably stop here, but I think uh, the future is really interesting for uh, uh, for geometric deep learning. Uh, 
uh, we'll probably be seeing more and more applications. So I, I wouldn't expect here to be really a kind of revolution that happened in computer vision with convolutional neural networks, but probably it will become a more standard tool in the arsenal of different uh, deep learning techniques and architectures, and they will be completely commonplace in uh, a, a broad range of problems because uh, graphs are really ubiquitous. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for this amazing talk. Um, so we will open now the floor for questions. For the people on Zoom, you can ask questions directly. For uh, the audience in YouTube, um, you can write your questions and I will read them um, to Michael. So maybe I, I will start with a question because I was really um, interested in, in these dynamic graphs that you mentioned. Um, so I don't know if you can say a couple of words there, like what do you think are, are the challenges or maybe applications that you're working on where you see dynamic graphs as, as a really, you know, tool with potential? Right, so I think uh, we should distinguish probably between, uh, uh, between two instances of dynamic graphs. So one, what we initially called dynamic graph CNNs was really uh, the kind of problems where we are given a, a point cloud. We actually consider three-dimensional point clouds as we see in computer vision, but you can think of uh, basically a set of features in some high dimensional feature space. So you don't have any graph. You just assume that there is a graph that, that somehow connects and represents the structure of this, of this data. And then uh, you just build a convenient graph to, uh, to represent the local structure of this, of this data. So again, if you think of three-dimensional point clouds, uh, it is very convenient because there is uh, some geometry that is baked into it. And uh, by updating this graph uh, throughout the neural network for the, uh, that making it optimal for the downstream task, we could show that, that, uh, that you can work better than just considering as a deep learning on sets, like uh, architectures such as point that uh, did. And uh, these ideas I think are really uh, more profound than just this. You can think of it as a kind of reincarnation of uh, uh, manifold learning or nonlinear dimensionality reduction, a popular class of techniques about 25 or 20 years ago uh, that are still used for data visualization, where you say that you assume that your data, even though it's very high dimensional, it has low intrinsic dimensionality. So you can, a convenient metaphor is sampling it from some low dimensional manifold that is uh, embedded in a space of very high co-dimension. And uh, usually this, the structure of this manifold is represented by some local k nearest neighbor graph. So then you uh, try to represent this graph in a low dimensional space, some kind of flattening. So usually it was done by uh, either taking uh, the, the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian, the famous eigenmaps, or using multidimensional scaling to, to represent uh, the geodesic distances on the graph. So this is uh, isomap and uh, many other algorithms that, that, that use similar ideas. And then you apply in this space, uh, low dimensional space, you apply machine learning. The problem, uh, there are several problems. First of all, usually in the original uh, representation space of the data, it's hard to capture any structure. So you need to massage the data to compute some features. Second, the way that you construct the graph affects hugely the way that uh, the low dimensional representation will look like. And uh, Laplacian eigenmaps maps are probably a good example for it. And then the way that you apply machine learning uh, is completely agnostic of how you construct the graph. So basically having these separate independent pre-processing stages was really uh, a deal breaker. And these methods never really worked. So they, you can use them to visualize data, but if you were to apply them to real problems, they had uh, a lot of handcrafting and tweaking. So now with graph neural networks, uh, with these kind of graph neural networks where you learn the latent graph on the fly, you can pack them into a single uh, differentiable pipeline end to end. So you build the graph that is optimal for the task that you're trying to solve. And I think this is, this is, uh, uh, this is really a uh, key uh, change. Uh, same thing with topological data analysis. So it suffers from the same problem that you need to, uh, to, to define your feature function that you will use then to construct the persistent homology and the way that you define it hugely affects uh, the output. So now you can build this function in a way that is optimal for the task that you are trying to solve. So what I, I, I hope and I, I predict what will happen in the next few years, we'll see the re-emergence the re of these ideas, but now with modern flavor and finally they will uh, probably deliver the, the, on the expectations. Now, the second aspect of dynamic graphs is really when the input graph is given, but it's not really a graph. It's, some stream of events that form the graph, like, uh, for example, a user following another user on Twitter or a user uh, retweeting a tweet or something like this. 
And in this case, it's uh, uh, you need somehow to capture the history of different uh, such events. And the way we address it in the uh, temporal graph network architecture is keeping a state that is updated every time we have such an event, and then we have a node embedding. So we have always some representation of the nodes, uh, which compresses uh, the, the, the past history of, uh, of events that form this graph. And one of the, the applications, so the good thing is that you can train this kind of architecture in self-supervised way. So you can train them, for example, to predict the next, uh, the next interaction. Uh, once you, uh, so this is how the encoder operates, the decoder will be task specific. So one of the, the typical applications that at least we are currently considering is a uh, uh, recommender system that can be formulated as edge prediction. I would like, for example, if uh, a user interacted with another user, uh, I would like to predict whether uh, uh, he or she would interact with uh, some user I. And uh, if I predict that this will happen at a certain point of time, maybe I will surface it in the application. I will recommend to follow this user, for example. Or I will recommend to buy a product, let's say, on Amazon. Or I will recommend to watch a movie on Netflix. And, uh, and so on. So that's, uh, that's the, the other aspect of dynamic graphs. But did I understand correctly that in this second uh, dynamic graph that you described, the graph is static itself? So the nodes are updated and, and evolved, but there are no nodes added or edges added or things like that? No, not at all. So nodes are added or even deleted. So, uh, well, uh, we, we, we didn't address uh, deletion events because we didn't have uh, such a data set, but uh, yeah, nodes can be added or edges can be added or deleted. Yeah, so that's exactly the stream of events. So, so when the node, when uh, for example, an edge is added, then you need to update the state of uh, the endpoints of it, or maybe the, their neighbors as well. Depends mm -hmm. on how we add this architecture. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any questions? Um, I maybe have a question regarding the um, Kip Welling paper, the slide where you presented the Kip Welling paper. You presented kind of a very, like my understanding from the paper was that they take a simple model of this whole spectrograph theory, restricting to the degree of one in the Chebyshev polynomials. And my question would be all the other papers, like you mentioned other papers on graph neural networks, are they all restricting themselves to this more simple model regarding the spectral theory? Or are they also taking higher dimensions of this Chebyshev polynomials as well? Right, so, uh, well, you can take higher dimensions, right? So higher dimension means that you have multi-hope filters. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was shown in full of works, uh, uh, architecture that was called uh, simplified GCN, it shows that you actually, you don't need uh, the non-linearities between different, uh, between different uh, uh, convolutional operations uh, are more or less useless. So you can just apply uh, a sequence of linear filters, which essentially turn into a multi-hop filter. And uh, we at Twitter, we had a, a paper where we took this idea to the extreme. We uh, pre-computed the filters. Basically, it's a linear diffusion on the graph with some operators that can be actually anything. They can be, for example, directional filters. You can do uh, an isotropic diffusion on graph using motifs. Uh, uh, so it's uh, it's a reweighted re graph on which you propagate information more in certain uh, directions, which uh, contribute to certain substructures. Once you have pre-computed, basically the rest is just multi-layer perceptron on this uh, pre-diffused data, and this is extremely scalable, extremely efficient architecture that surprisingly, it, it's on some graphs, works uh, almost on par with uh, much more advanced architectures. But it's uh, two orders of, of magnitude faster and really, really scalable. So we could apply it to graphs with uh, 100 million nodes and uh, basically keep everything in the GPU memory. So uh, uh, it's an interesting question when uh, these kind of things can be done on which graphs. On which graphs uh, you would uh, benefit from nonlinearity and on which not. And uh, it is probably more a fundamental theoretical question. One of the big difference between graph neural networks and uh, convolutional neural networks that in convolutional neural networks, if you think of uh, initial architectures that, that, that appeared like AlexNet, uh, 
they were relatively shallow, just a few conventional layers, I think six, but with very big filters, I think 11 by 11 pixels. And the community moved to, to very deep architectures with tens of maybe even hundreds of conventional layers, but extremely small filters, as small as three by three or even one by one pixels. Now, one of the reasons why you do it besides computational complexity is uh, compositionality. You can compose complex features from simple ones. Like uh, ideally somewhere down uh, deeper in the network, you will have the, the, these uh, phantomatical uh, grand, uh, grandmother neurons. Uh, on graphs, apparently you cannot do it. So it's a wishful thinking that from message passing, you can, uh, for example, represent triangles. So you cannot construct really complex graph structures uh, from uh, nodes and edges. And that, that's the key limitation. So uh, it's, uh, I don't think that we have a definite answer yet uh, whether uh, depth or when depth is useful on graphs. Actually, I, I even wrote a blog post about it that was rather controversial because people talking about deep learning on graphs and doing uh, neural networks with two convolutional layers, this is not exactly deep. And when you try to do more, it doesn't really work in most cases. So, so you really need to work hard to do it. And uh, there are very interesting uh, recent papers like the one I mentioned about the, the, the bottleneck phenomenon that, that shows actually uh, in what kind of graphs message passing doesn't work well. And what helps is simply rewiring the graph, even making it fully connected. So when you do it with attention, you get something similar to transformer architectures, uh, uh, but then, then uh, it brings up the question, do you really need to do message passing on the same graph that is provided as input? And I don't have an answer to it. I think it requires a deeper uh, research. Thank you very much. Okay, I have a question, Michael. How do you see the connection between graph neural networks and attention-based models like transformers? More or less the same thing, or just like a transformers, a specific way of doing graph neural networks? Well, of course, you can think of transformers as a, as a specific uh, way of doing graph neural networks. I think from what I know, and uh, take it with a grain of salt, I'm not an expert in this. I think for language models, uh, people tried using graphs, basically some kind of uh, pre-computed graphs, it didn't provide much advantage. I think a completely different story though is with knowledge graphs. So when you want uh, really to understand language, I think knowledge graphs and uh, uh, graph neural networks on these kind of heterogeneous graphs can really be uh, uh, of a significant advantage. And there are multiple works recently that try to apply uh, deep learning to knowledge graphs, biological graphs, for example, not, uh, uh, graphs that, that incorporate different types of entities such as, uh, for example, drug targets, drugs themselves, side effects, different types of interactions. These are knowledge graphs. Uh, so this really works. And um, I think there will be uh, more interesting uh, papers uh, uh, and research in this domain and uh, probably some applications that could be groundbreaking. Okay, I might have a, a question about the generalization part. So you said that the generalization in graph neural networks is not really understood or studied. Like, can you say a bit more about that? Right, so I think, well, I mentioned one result on generalization, which is uh, more or less uh, um, perturbation analysis. So how uh, the perturbation of the, of, uh, the, uh, the graph that underlies on uh, which you, you learn the filter, how it affects the output of the filter. So this is more a uh, uh, functional theory or uh, signal processing uh, type of analysis. I think in terms of the generalization, basically the counterpart of expressive power, uh, your, your model can be very expressive, but uh, not generalized. So if you think of something like positional encoding, so uh, you want your message passing to be uh, aware of the node on which it operates. So you want a different way of doing message passing at different nodes. Now, the, the, the most naive way of doing it is just to assign some random labels to each node. So randomly code with random features at the nodes. And then of course, each node will have a different way of doing message passing. So it will be very expressive, right? Now, uh, there is no way whatsoever, of course, to, to repeatably create the same random features on a different graph. So it will be very expressive, but extremely poorly generalizable. Now, the, the other extreme, of course, is to do message passing exactly the same way on each node. And these are rather weak 
uh, first maybe generation of, of graph neural networks that uh, are not aware of the context where they operate. So the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. So you, you, you need to trade off expressive power with generalization. So structural encoding seems to be a way of doing it. But of course, then the key question is how you select this structure, which structures to count. Is it triangles? Is it clicks? Is it cycles? In some cases, you know it a priori. In some cases, you might uh, do some kind of uh, term frequency, inverse document frequency kind of analysis. But this is heuristic. So trying to understand uh, basically how to select the structures or maybe even learn them uh, is key. And th th these kind of projects are actually being attempted for uh, molecular graphs. So uh, junction tree variational autoencoders uh, of Tommy Yakola, for example, they uh, build the vocabulary of structures from which they compose the molecules. Uh, but they didn't really address the problem of generalization, which, for example, in, uh, in molecular discovery is extremely important. One of the hopes that, that you would like to see in this field of, of, of computational chemistry is that uh, the, the, the search space is really huge. Well, if, if you can still see the slide, I think the estimate of the number of synthesizable molecules is 10 to the 60. So it's uh, completely uh, mind boggling, right? Uh, we don't have that many molecules at all. So we don't, uh, we maybe, we have worked in the lab with maybe a few millions or tens of millions of molecules. So the number of samples from which you can learn is really small. And the hope is that it, you would be able to generalize the molecules that you have, you have never seen, never experienced uh, 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 in this world. And uh, uh, th that's really the promise. If you want to design a new antibiotic, it will likely be, or it hopefully will be something that you have never seen before. So uh, we don't know anything about this kind of generalization yet. Okay. Good. So. We have time for one last question, if there is one. Okay. Otherwise, um, I think it's time to uh, time to close. Thank you, Michael, so much for such an interesting presentation and discussion. I'm sure um, everyone will appreciate it. We will put also the. Um, like the event online on YouTube for people to watch later. Um, and yes, thank you for, for participating and, and for being here, even if only virtually, hopefully next time uh, we will be able to, to host you in a more formal setting, let's say. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Laura. Thank you, guys.